see you all here as we come to worship uh, in our fellowship hall, and we're glad we can do this. Um, it is about 80 degrees um, in the sanctuary today, so I know some of you may still be a little bit warmer here, but it is definitely cooler in here than the sanctuary, so we're glad that you're here worshiping with us today. I want to mention a couple things to you. So um, just outside these double doors, um, there's uh, some welcome cards, prayer cards. If you are a guest with us today, we would love to have some information uh, about you, a way that we can connect with you. Also on this card are prayer concerns. So if you have a prayer concern you would like to share what the church to be uh, to be aware of and to pray for, please uh, grab one of those cards and fill that out and leave it with us. Also, um, this morning our children will be remaining in worship the whole time. And so, uh, moms and dads, if you didn't already do this, outside of the table out here, there's some crayons and there's some, uh, some papers for the children to work with. So, um, please feel free. You can do this now. You can walk outside and grab some of those things. It's perfectly all right to do that if you haven't done so. Crayon and a worksheet out there on the table. Um, because of that, we're also doing a couple of things this morning differently in worship. This morning, um, we have uh, four of our elementary school age children uh, leading us in scripture reading today. And so I'm very thankful to Kathy Murphy and to Jewel Potty and to Cody and to Jake Wallace and to Grayson Turner for um, uh, leading us in worship by reading scripture today. And they have uh, prepared for all that and they are ready for us. So I'm thankful for their leadership. Also this morning we're going to do uh, our prayer time differently. We're going to do prayers for the people. So I want to encourage the children to, um, to make sure that they uh, can participate. And so for moms and dads and kids, I want you to think about do you have a prayer concern that you would like to lift up in worship um, or a thanksgiving. And I see the, the sound is different. So, um, so prayers for the people, we'll do it this way. I will say a short sentence about what we'll be praying for, and then I'll have silence. At that silence, anybody in the congregation, anybody here in the flesh of Paul, you just say, and say, uh, please pray for Aunt Joe. Whatever. Whatever prayer concern on your mind, you say that. When I hear you say something, I will then say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. All right? I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Excellent. And then somebody else will say something. I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Okay? So that'll be that part. We come to part of Thanksgiving. Um, I will then say, um, I'll have a short sentence about the offer to now lift up our prayers of praise and Thanksgiving. And then I'll have silence, and then you pray, you lift up something in Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for a new job, whatever it may be. You say that out loud, and then I will say, we lift our hearts, and then you say, thanks be to God. Okay? So you're saying, thanks be to God. We lift our hearts. Thanks be to God. All right, and that's how we're going to pray this morning. And that way, our children um, can participate in all of our adults in worship. And we thank you all for doing that today. Um, let's see, anything else? So we might have some guests this week. Uh, we have a bishop group uh, from New York that are with us this week. They're going to be staying in Huntington, and they'll be stationed here at Fifth Avenue. They'll be having some of their meals here and some of their meetings here as they work in our community. And so we're thankful for the Way Center from uh, Almara Heights, New York. Would you all stand if you're a part of that group? Would you all stand? <laughs> Thank you all so much for serving Christ in our community, and we're glad that we can open our uh, house of worship for you this week, and we're thankful that you can be with us worshiping today. All right, I don't think I have anything else. I think we're good. So as John begins the prelude, let us turn our hearts to God and reflect on our time to prepare for worship.
O Lord, hear my voice. I cry out to you, seeking your mercy. If you have to record all our mistakes, all our regrets, all our sins, who would bear have heard? But you are a God of forgiveness, of steadfast love and mercy, who chooses not to remember our sins. We praise your name and worship you as the God of love, forgiveness, and mercy. We wait for you and hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than children wait for the last day of school. Our hope is in the Lord, for God's steadfast love renews us each day.
like to invite the children to come down and join me. The younger brother decided to leave the family business, you remember that, the farm, and he wanted to venture out on his own and do his own thing. So he asked his father to give him the money that he would get normally, not, not until the father had passed away. So this was a really bold request and probably hurt the father's feelings, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Um, so he, he went out, like many parents, the father was gracious and gave his son what he wanted, even though it was not his favorite idea. So the son had an adventure of a lifetime, right? He goes out and does all the things he wants to do and he spends all his money. And because of his choices, he finds himself working in horrible conditions and decides to return home to work for his father. And he begged for forgiveness. So the father is overjoyed in his return. And that is where we start today. Okay? So before we move on, do you guys know what forgiveness is? Anybody want to, what do you think? Okay. Hold that thought. All right. So I'm going to ask, we'll see if everybody wants to contribute. So do you think forgiveness uh, looks like this? Boy, she really made me mad. Here she comes again. She just really makes me mad. I don't like her. Oh, I'm just so mad. I can't stand when she does that. I'm just so mad, I could pop. You think that's forgiveness? No. Okay. Oh, I really don't like when they do that. I wish they weren't even in my class. I wish they'd stop playing near me. I don't like them. I know she said I'm sorry, but I just can't get over it. But you know what? I'm supposed to not be angry, so I'm just going to put it away, and I'm going to keep it inside. I'm not going to act like I'm angry, but I'm going to store it up until something else happens, and I'm stretched so thin that I can't hold any more, and I pop. Sorry. But then, you know, maybe maybe that some growth happens. You get a little better at forgiving. You think forgiveness looks like this? I cannot blow a balloon. <laughs> well, maybe she just made me a little bit mad. <laughs> he sure was grumpy today. But I'm going to let that go because maybe he was having a bad day. My mailman left my packages in the rain, but I'm going to let it go because I still got my packages and they're okay. So you get the idea. For some reason, I'm struggling with it. So. Um, so we get upset and then we let it go. Do you think that that's forgiveness? No. Okay. You still get filled with... Anger and disappointment. And when we get filled over and over and stretched really thin, like it's really hard to reuse a balloon, isn't it? It's real that's that's kind of how we are. And we get stretched so thin and something comes along again, catches us off guard, and we just pop. Maybe. Wow! This balloon. Yeah. It has to be a really big event. Okay. You get the point. Okay. So we're going to look at a different picture of 
still give the best right now. All right? So remember when I said the father, the story was about a father and two brothers. All right? The older brother stays home. And he obeyed his father. He always did what was asked of him. And he makes good choices and he follows the rules of the family plan. And he was probably mad that his brother left him to do some of the work, don't you think? Yeah, he just took off and did what he wanted and left him here to do all the work. And so now he's outraged that this brother is home and he is being celebrated. Right? Miss Rachel talked about that last week, about somebody getting a reward when they didn't deserve it. So he'd never been given a party for what he had done right. He refused to go into the house. I'm not going in there. I'm not going to take part of that celebration. I can't possibly be happy for him. So the father comes out, tries to encourage the older son. And so the father, you know, we talked about how the son leaving may have hurt the father. But you know what? His son was so important to him that he tied off his balloon. And he wasn't going to let anger and sadness and bitterness fill him. Right? So he stayed like this. So the father goes out and he tries to encourage the older son. He says, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. And he tells the son that they have to celebrate and rejoice. The gift of new life, when someone they thought was missing, has been found. When the someone they thought was dead has new life. So Jesus told this story so that we can know how much God loves us. And when we make mistakes or wander off on our own way, get lost or do things that, in a way that somebody that, that really blows up somebody else's balloon, then God always forgives us. And he always welcomes us home into the family of God, just like the father in today's story. So this father's example shows us that we can choose the relationship with someone over being right or righteous. We can choose to love and celebrate when they decide to follow Jesus instead of being mad. I'm not going to pop it again. You don't have to put your fingers in there. Um, they did not do it the way we did. And we can choose to rejoice instead of resent them. We can choose to heal instead of hurt. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your love and forgiveness. Help us to choose to forgive others the way you forgive us. And to welcome others home into your family with open arms. In Jesus' name, amen.
Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. Please accept these gifts and with them our lives to be used in your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray for Linda. 
and the Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Scott Ballard surgery on Tuesday. Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayers. situations in our own country with storms coming through and bad weather destroying homes. We know that you are repairing people's lives in the midst of all of this. Would you call us to be your people for them? For all the situations in our community, across our state and our nation, around the world, we lift these up to you in prayer. Your brother has returned. 
Your father has declared a feast and demanded music and dancing because he has received his son back safe and sound. The older brother was furious. I will never attend that party. I cannot believe father would do this to me. His father left the party and found his older son. He pleaded with him to come home. Listen, for all these years I have been working like a servant for you, and I have never disobeyed you. Yet you have never even given me a dinner to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who wasted your money on wild parties and drinking, you throw a big party for him. Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we must celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. That's where Jesus stopped. How do you think the story is? This, this is, is the, the word of God for the, for the people, people of God. Thanks be to God. asked me when I was going to sing this song again. And I said, well, whenever they have somebody uh, solo sing again. <laughs> so, Tony, this is for you and for God. <laughs> when troubles surround us, when evils come, the body grows weak, the spirit grows numb. When these things be said, God doesn't forget us. He sends his love on the wings of a dove, on the wings of a snow white dove. He sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above, on the wings of a dove. When the Most famous parable has a second act. 
Remember, the story began with a simple telling sentence. A man had two sons. With the lost son having returned and to the father's embrace and with the band playing and the feast beginning, we now meet the older son, the obedient one. His story begins as the younger son's story concludes. The older son returns from the fields where he had been working, which is just where you expect an obedient, dutiful son to be, right? Doing what he's supposed to do. Jesus, the storyteller, does not disappoint. The older son hears the music playing. He sees caterers walking around with stacks of plates and cups. He stops one of the workers asking, what's going on? The news of the brother's return and his father's celebration infuriates him. He cannot believe his dad was throwing this party for his good-for-nothing brother. I don't know that Grayson could have done it better with stomping his foot <laughs> upon that moment, right? So he refuses to go into the celebration as news spreads and neighbors begin showing up. He paces in the courtyard. He refuses to go in and he scowls at the folks who are entering. Word reaches the father. The father that had sprang from his rocking chair on the front porch as soon as he caught sight of his younger son in the distance and he ran as fast as his old legs would take him until finally he could give him a bear hug and they fell on the ground. Now, a couple hours later, he is going out again to his other son. The exchange does not start well. Bishop Desmond Tutu, in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, changed my mind how I thought about forgiveness. If you've read this book, you know that it's about South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was created after apartheid had ended and Nelson Mandela had been elected president. Tutu describes in the book some of the terrible, terrible things that were done during the days of apartheid to terrorize the native black population. Not only were thousands murdered, but many were murdered in agonizing, disturbing ways. It polarized that country in ways that our red state, blue state political division cannot fathom. Which is why it is so important for us to learn how to cultivate forgiveness for these days. If South Africa could be saved with all that they did, what could cultivating forgiveness do for us and our society and our churches and our nation? After Mandela's election, South Africa decided that it would offer amnesty, amnesty to the perpetrators of apartheid crime. However, amnesty would only be offered, would only be granted if you, in court, swore under oath and you told the truth about all the things that you had done. If you lied about it, if you didn't come forward and truthfully tell the whole thing, including all the people who had participated with you, then you could be tried for your crimes and anything you had said would be used against you. Amnesty came at a price. You had to confess to everything you had done and everyone who had done it with you. 
Jufu's commentary about what they did forces us to ask, what is justice? It's a term we often use, but it has to be defined. Oftentimes we think of justice as kind of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But when somebody does terrible, severe crimes, there is no way that that ever can be paid for. The way justice was done in South Africa was that justice and forgiveness were intertwined. Justice meant that those who had done evil deeds they had to reveal what they did in front of everyone. Their family, people who loved them and respected them, now saw a different side of them. People they worked with saw what they had done. Neighbors saw what they had done. Those who had done evil were exposed through their own confession. And victims' families finally heard what had happened to their loved ones. In the book, there's one woman who simply comes out and says, she goes, I have wondered so long what happened to my brother. I want to forgive, but I don't know who to forgive. Powerful stories are in this book. And Tutu, in talking about this, saw that this was the way that South Africa had to heal. Justice had to be with forgiveness. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission saved that country from falling into revenge killings and civil war. Forgiveness gave South Africa a future. And that's how it changed my mind about forgiveness. Because, like many of us, I had often thought of forgiveness as simply something dealing with the past, forgiving past actions. I will often ask, as many of us do, does this person deserve forgiveness? This person who has hurt me, do they deserve my forgiveness? But that's the wrong question. Since forgiveness is about the future, See, what's done is done. It's water under the bridge. And Guy Sales has helped tell us we're on a bridge right now. This congregation is on a bridge. And all the past things, they have gone under the water and they are out. Down the Ohio River, we're talking about one of these bridges that connect us across the river. Forgiveness is about whether you're going to have a future anymore with the person who has wronged you. Or maybe you're going to have any kind of a future of a life worth living for yourself. Or if you're going to hold on to that hurt, those big balloons, and have it to stay the rest of your life because you cannot let go of your wound. Tutu's idea that there is no future without forgiveness rings as true in everyday life as it does for global and societal events. If we are going to cultivate forgiveness into our lives and into this church and into this society, we have to start by changing the question we ask from, does this person deserve forgiveness? To, what kind of future do I want? It's not just for the other person's sake that we should forgive. It's for our own sakes. The way Jesus told the story, I imagine that once the father got out to the courtroom where the son was stomping his foot and scowling at everybody who went inside the party to welcome his brother back, I imagine the father getting close to him and sitting down but the older brother is not about to sin. The words in this section of the story jump off the page. The brother is incredulous. Listen, he says to his father. It's a word that puts down the father. The elder son, for the moment, is in charge. 
and the father must listen. The father sits and listens to his son's grievance. Listen! For all these years, I've been working for you like a slave. He used the term of injustice, slave, to describe their relationship. He does not see their relationship anymore as father and son, but as slave and slave master. I have never disobeyed you. Yet you have never given me even so much as a young goat so that I might gather a few of my friends and celebrate together. The son's language is full of hurt and anger. He may have been a dutiful son, but he speaks coldly of their relationship. But when this son of yours returned, he says, the phrase son of yours is set like an expletive. And it notes the severed relationship between the two sibling rivals. The elder brother is no longer even acknowledging a relationship. The man who had returned is only the son to the father. He is nothing to the older son. The one who had devoured the father's money on prostitutes and drugs and alcohol and wild parties receives of all things upon his return but another party. Maybe one a little bit more reserved and legal, but nonetheless, it serves as an indictment. An indictment in the brother's eyes of his father and of his son. This is who they are, partiers. There is no future in this household right now in the storm. In this older brother's mind, the younger brother has returned. He is being hugged and kissed by relatives and neighbors alike this very moment inside the house. While the older brother is outside, not even acknowledging a relationship with him anymore. He sees the father as a slave master who has enabled his drunken return son to party on. And now the angry brother is the one giving commands. Listen! He commands his father. And his father obeys. Fred Luskin has been a researcher on forgiveness for decades and runs actually a forgiveness center on the campus of Stanford University in California. In his book, Forgive for Good, he talks about one woman who had attended one of his forgiveness seminars. And she approached him after the lecture of the Q&A section. She goes up to him to speak to him personally. And she talks about this person in her life, her mother, that she just could not forgive. And Luskin kind of returns to some of the points he had made in his lecture. And then she reveals one new piece of information. Her mother had been dead for 10 years. 10 years. And she was still holding on to all this anger. She still wouldn't forgive her mother. And who was all this anger hurting? Certainly it wasn't hurting her dead mother, right? If you imagine your life. Imagine your emotional life. Like a set of rooms in a house. Imagine how much room in your house you are willing to give to those who have hurt you. How much of that balloon that Katie shared with the kids. You allow that balloon to take more and more space, take more and more space in your home, your emotional home. We only have so much space, right, that our emotions can handle at one time. When we hold on to our hurts, our grudges, our bitter past, we are multiplying the pain that was first inflicted upon us. The event that first caused us pain is gone. Like the river's waters, it's gone under the bridge 
way down the river way. However, if we do not forgive, if we do not allow that wound to begin healing, and every time we see that person, or every time we get in a similar situation, we open that wound up all over again, and it festers, and it festers, and it gets infected. And here's the most frustrating part. We give this person who has hurt us, we give them the power to continue to hurt us when we hold on to that anger. But we're the one giving them power to them. The event's long gone. Forgiveness, you see, removes the power that they have over us and empowers us to take control of our lives once again. We can't control what happens to us. So when people do things to us to hurt us, we are rightfully angry about that. We can't control that, but we can control how we will respond to that hurt. And forgiveness gives us a way of gaining the control back into our lives. <coughs> I choose to forgive you. Whether you deserve it or not, I'm choosing it for me. And some hurts, of course, do hold scars. Some Hurts are deep in our lives. To forgive someone doesn't always mean there's going to be reconciliation. Some hurts are too tough to bring reconciliation. If a wife is physically abused by her husband, once freed from that terror, she may choose to forgive him to get her life back, to control of her life again, but no one should tell her she has to return. That is a dangerous situation that she probably should never do. To forgive does not always mean there's reconciliation. To forgive someone doesn't always mean you're going to forget it. To forgive and forget may be a rememberable saying, but it's not the Bible. You can forgive, but sometimes it is impossible to forget. To forgive means that even if you do remember, you will not hold it against that person any longer. Maybe you remember a lot of other things in your relationship beyond that hurt. A lot of good things in the relationship. You'll remember that as well. And that is bigger than this hurt. To cultivate forgiveness, we have to start asking ourselves how much emotional energy are we willing to spend on our hurt? Wouldn't it be better to let that go? To let the past go? And to spend your emotional energy on far more important things. On joyous things. On loving things. Things that give you life. Not things that suck the life out of you and drain you. One time, a mother in our congregation was struggling with her drug-addicted son, and she was meeting with me to just to kind of process things, and she yelled at me in frustration, Why is he doing this to me? Of course, what's it about her? But he was caught in his own world of loneliness and isolation and hurt and addiction and she couldn't see that because of all the hurt it had caused her. In time she came to understand that what her son was doing was not about her. And just that that separation that it wasn't about her was able to shift her mind and she was able to forgive him and to reconcile and to become a strength, a refuge in his life again. Amen. Forgiving someone who has hurt you or wronged you may not bring happy reconciliation. It may not wipe away all the scars, but your forgiveness will give your future back to you to empower you to let the past go 
and to live in the present. Whatever happened in the past between these two sibling rivals in Jesus' parable has driven a wedge between them that's apparent in the story. And without forgiveness, there is no future in this household. The father invites his older son into the future. Son, he says, changing the narrative from the harsh word slave. Son, you're not a slave. You're my son. Son, you are always with me. The father reminds the older brother that they have been close. They have been together. Maybe especially since the younger son left. And then they didn't hear a word from him the whole time he was gone. Son, you are always with me and I am always with you. And all that I have is yours. The father reminds the older brother about the deal the younger brother had made when he said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me what's my inheritance and I'm out of here. And the father cashes in some investment funds, sells some hard assets, maybe even takes a loan to give the younger son half of the property. And then he's gone. The father is reminding the older brother of that deal and how the deal has not changed. Because now everything that's left is the 50% that's left and everything that's mine is yours. I remember the deal. I'm not going to change my mind and give your younger brother some more things. Everything I have is yours. Son, I'm always with you and you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The Father is reminding him of the relationships, of how the past is setting up the future. Reestablishing their narrative has changing the way that the Father can invite the older brother back to the future. But we had to celebrate, he says. We had to celebrate because this brother of yours, not just son of mine, but brother of yours, was dead, is now alive, was lost, and now found. The brother of yours, the father says, to his angry older son, reestablishes the relationship. The future is going to include the lost son, the prodigal son. The father is making that clear. If the older son wants to be a part of this future in this family and not stuck outside in the courtyard or in the fields working alone, he's going to have to forgive this brother of his. <coughs> there is a sentence in the Lord's Prayer. We say it every week in worship. Forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us or trespass against us. This is a dangerous prayer, right? Forgive us, God, as, as much as I'm good at forgiving. I'll see next week some of y'all skip that line. <laughs> some might think it's kind of small of God to require us to forgive if we want to be forgiven. It makes it seem like faith is a transaction. But I don't think it's so much as God won't forgive unless we forgive in as much it is unless we work in forgiving others. We have no idea what forgiveness is about. Right? Until we've been hurt and we choose forgiveness and to let it go, we don't know what it's about. And people can forgive us. We can do things like and we have no idea what it means. God can forgive us and we have no idea what it means until we begin forgiving others. And then we realize, ah, that's what people are doing for me. That's what God is doing for me. Working at forgiving others might be seen as a selfish act. If you say, I can't forgive him, he doesn't deserve it, you've missed the point. The question is, 
Do you deserve it? Do you deserve letting go of that anger? Do you deserve putting the past behind and creating a future? Do you deserve not holding a grudge? Do you deserve understanding the deep struggle and reward of forgiving someone so that when someone forgives you, when God forgives you, you fully and deeply receive it gladly as a gift? Without forgiveness, there is no future in a marriage. Without forgiveness, there is no future in parent-child relationships or sibling relationships. Without forgiveness, there is no future in friendships. Without forgiveness, there is no future for office staff or for business partnerships or for churches. Without forgiveness, there is no future for communities and societies and nations. Future is hard, yes. Not forgiving. I just said that wrong. Didn't I? Forgiveness is hard. Yes. But not forgiving is harder still. At the end of our readers' theater scripture reading, Hadley Murphy said, and that's where Jesus stopped. Noting that while Jesus completed the parable, he didn't end the story. He left it open-ended. And then Hadley asked you, how do you think the story ends? What do you think? Did the older brother stay outside on the patio? Or did he finally come in? Maybe stay on the edge for a bit until he finally walks up to his brother and they hug. Did he stay out there, stewing, scowling, while everyone else is having a great time? What do you think happens? This is important because your answer might tell you how much you are cultivating forgiveness in your own life. Friends, forgive to give yourself a future. Amen. We end our worship service in our Baptist tradition of ending with the commitment hymn. And we open our doors of fellowship. We would love for any of you to become a part of this church. Maybe you've been around our church for long. You've worshipped with us for a while, but you've not chosen to join our congregation. We would love this to be the day and whatever you want us. Or maybe. You've loved God for a long time, but you've never made a confession of faith in Jesus. And you want this day to say, I want to come forward to be a disciple of Jesus all my life, to be baptized in this congregation. Whatever decision you might have, I'll be by the communion table and will gladly receive you while we all stand together and sing M648. Let's stand together and say.
might as well just be seated for a moment. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things to you. Uh, we had several folks who led us in worship today, and Emma, where are you sitting there? There you are, way in the back. Emma, thank you for leading us in worship this song. That was beautiful. I'm glad to And I want to make sure that we thank our readers of Scripture today for uh, Jewel Pody and to Hallie Murphy and Jacob Wallace and Grayson Turner. Thank you all again. And for John, um, Seth, we appreciate all those who jump in and help us with worship, and especially those who are handling the, the sound and the audiovisual. That also makes things happen, especially for people who are home watching the service. Appreciate them making it possible to to worship with us while we're here in this space. Um, Katie, would you come up? So I want to uh, I've asked Katie to come forward, and I'm going to make sure I say some things the way I want to say them. Uh, so. I'm asking Katie to come forward because we have some good news to share. As many of you know, Katie has been with our congregation for nearly 20 years, and her family, her children have grown up here. She's been a part of this congregation for a long time. And a few years ago, uh, this congregation licensed her uh, to preach the gospel for gospel ministry. And about that same time, you began seminary, right? So, and she's partly through uh, earning her Master of Divinity, which is the degree that most churches um, require as the standard to be a, a minister or a pastor of a congregation. So Katie's been working on all of this for some time and still has a little bit of seminary classes to go. But evidently, the Holy Spirit is trying to speed things up. And she has been called to serve another congregation as her pastor. And in a few weeks down the road, she and her family will be leaving this area which necessitates all sorts of things. Uh, not the least which is trying to get a house ready to move, right? And so for this short time, while things, all the details are coming in place, we're going to withhold the name and the location of the church um, because that church will officially announce her in a very short time as her new pastor. But for this time, it's time for us to also work on this transition. Um, don't be putting their house up on the market soon. As soon as they do that, all sorts of rumors, I'm sure, will be happening around the congregation. So we want to get out ahead of that and to share this news with you. Also, the personnel committee will begin working with Katie as they figure out how we will have someone to take care of all the duties and things she does in our congregation. And she can begin training that person, hopefully, if we can bring somebody on board. She has said she wants to be here and help us make this transition. And so we want to make sure we're here for her for as long as that time goes before the church is ready to call her and bring her on board. Well, they've already called her to bring her on board. Um, so this is a time of celebration. So this is not goodbye yet. We've still got several more weeks down the road. We'll work on those details uh, with the personnel committee. Um, but today, we want to congratulate Katie and to share our love with her and her family. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to ask... Uh, Jewel and Alda and Derek to come forward and after the benediction I want you all to come forward and just share give them a hug, share them the congratulations their love for them, but no goodbyes yet you don't have to get teary eyed yet, right? Uh, just don't ask them where they're moving, okay? Don't do that yet uh, I also want to say you know, I personally am really excited for Katie and um, I gotta say um, I'm, I'm envious of you because I remember um, when I was younger and was called to become a senior pastor at my first congregation. And the big step that was, and the excitement I had for that. And so I just am so excited for you, for what God is doing in you and for this congregation you're going to. Um, it's a great big thing. And as I said a couple weeks ago in, uh, in my sermon, Andy Diller said, you have to throw yourself into life. And so I just, I want so much of you to throw yourself in this big opportunity God has given you, and we want to bless that. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to bless that. We're going to say goodbye down the road. We're going to bless that today. So uh, since I've been here, I also want to remind you, since I've been here just after Easter, we've celebrated five baptisms. We have another one that's going to happen soon. Uh, we've had a child dedication. We've had two other young adults join our congregation, and now we're going to celebrate what God is doing in Katie's life. There are some great things happening in this congregation. And I hope you all are celebrating that. And I want us to take time at the end of this service and then later on in a few weeks to celebrate this big moment in Katie's life. 
So, um, Jewel and you get your brother and get you to get, bring them on up here. And um, let's all stand together for the benediction. I want them by the communion table and then you can come forward and greet them after the benediction. <laughs> Friends, as you go back out into the world, love God with your whole being, all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So give yourself a break too. And love your enemies until we become friends and we can transform this world. Go now knowing the God, the creator of the universe, has already prepared a way for you. And Jesus the Christ walks beside of you. And the Holy Spirit, God's unconditional, everlasting love, is swirling around you to guide you through all the things you face. So go now with God's peace. Amen. Amen.